Hi everyone, welcome to Play Hokey with me. My name is Roz. I hope everyone's doing great today. Before we get started, I just want to say a quick thank you to all of you that uh, take the time to watch these videos, uh, like and subscribe. It means the world to me. It encourages me and I really do look forward to making these videos for you week by week. So this week's tutorial is all about the graph again. It's primarily focused on the beginner. Those of you that are interested in doing a C to C uh, pictorial blanket or project and maybe feel a bit intimidated by the switching of colors or dealing with all the strands of yarn. I want to share five tips that have really helped me and I'm hoping that they will help you too. Okay, so as always, there are timestamps below so you can jump to the point of interest and yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Tip number one, use a stitch marker. And this is when you first start your very first square, go ahead and make sure you can either use a stitch marker like I have or just a strand of yarn to put in that very first corner or first block that you make. The reason why is because once you start building, you're moving up and down on the diagonal and you are going to be turning your work back and forth. And I do lose track. So this is crucial to me to uh, just save me a world of hurt and it reduces a lot of frogging because I always know where I have started, where my very first block is. While we're on the subject of starting and the stitch marker, let's go ahead and talk with a mini tip here about the graph itself and where you begin. Should I be working from right bottom to left top or from left bottom to right top? Well, that's really a personal preference. I think a lot of people have started working from the right to the left because the natural default of a graph, uh, the numbering starts on the right hand side. But if you feel more comfortable with working from the left. I know I did initially because you know you have the knot from the very first chain uh, on the left hand it hangs to the left and so you just naturally feel like you should be moving to the right. If you feel if you still feel that way then by all means just go ahead and cross out the numbers and renumber it for yourself so that you can work from the left if it's more comfortable. Uh, if you have a program you can also do that. You can just edit it to make the numbers uh, on your left side of your graph here. There's no right or wrong is my point with this. Just do what is comfortable to you. Mini tip number two, you probably already know this, but I'm just going to mention it anyway. I would highly suggest that you put arrows for yourself when you're working up the diagonal or down the diagonal. It makes a huge difference because you know, you're counting your tiles and the colors that you need to do and it's very easy to lose track again. And so it's just as simple as you work on your first block and then when you get ready to do row two, you just put a little arrow somewhere on your, your graph here to let yourself know what you're doing. I like to put little numbers for each uh, block that I'm working on and then when I'm done, I just go ahead and cross it all out and then start the process over again. And this is how I like to do it. I like to put a number for each color that I'm going to be making. So one black and two green. And here I'll show you uh, where I really am right now on my graph. So the next part that I'm going to be doing, I will be starting the downward diagonal. And as you can see, I have my numbers for what I will need to be doing. Tip number two, I like to call measuring your yarn. And really this is a happy compromise for me between using bobbins and um, snipping a lot. It saves time on my snipping so that I'm not weaving in a lot of ends, but I'm also not dealing with bobbins. And as beautiful as they look, and it looks so well organized, it just isn't right for me. I like the freedom of these strands and I promise you, uh, they're quite long. They're not attached to any skeins, but uh, they do not tangle. It's lightweight. I don't get stressed out or confused with it. It really does work for me. And what I found is that I like to measure the yarn. 
To measure my yarn, I simply mean that I just make a tile, I decide what uh, yarn I'm going to use and what size hook, and then once I've made my block, I unravel it like this, and then either with a tape measure or with my body, I measure the length to see how much yarn it takes to make one block. So for me, for this one, it was about 18 inches when I did it before, or from my body, just with my hand outstretched from thumb to shoulder, this was the length, one length to make a block. So this is what I use to kind of guesstimate as I'm working along. I'm snipping as I go, I don't mind, but I can then kind of see, if I can see that I'm coming up there, I'm going to need two, um, two blocks, I'm gonna make two blocks. So I know I'm going to do two lengths of this blue, okay? And that for me is manageable. Then I can have about three to four lengths they don't get tangled and it's very lightweight and it does reduce on the snipping because I kind of have an idea of how much yarn I'm going to use. Tip number three, the magic knot. Now you may be averse to having any knots in your work. Uh, that may not appeal to you, but I can tell you I do not have any issues with knots and it's very hard to see them once you've done the work. Um, I can only, if I hunt for it, then I can find it. Here is one knot that I do have that I know for sure is there, uh, but I've done at least, I'd say at least four knots in, in, this, in this portion of the blanket, and that is the only one that I can eyeball and see uh, to show you. I like to use the magic knot because then I can, uh, it saves me weaving in a lot of ends. I can continue on. Let's say I can see now that I do need a, another length or two to make a couple more blocks. I can easily do that with the little tail that I have left over. Now I do have a video tutorial on how to do the magic knot. I'll probably do this a bit too quickly to see properly on here. So I will leave a link for that in the description box below but essentially you're doing two knots. Here's one, and then I'm going to attach these two on the other side here. Oops, not you. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take both of these knots and pull them together. And I'm telling you, this is not coming apart. I pull it together like so it nice and tight and I can cut as close as I want to this knot and it's not going to affect it in any way. Pull, pull, pull. It's not going anywhere and this you will not see it. You will not see it in your work it will disappear. And that's what I love so much about it. And that is just going to extend your skein here and save you some weaving in. Tip number four is all about weaving in ends. And the tip here is don't. <laughs> just be patient with it. Uh, I learned this the hard way that it's best just to wait four or five rounds before you darn anything in because you're still working on those pieces and you want to have some control over the tightening and the maneuvering of it. And there are times where you may have miscounted your tiles and you need to frog something. And it's such a pain to do if you've taken all that time to darn things in. So I would wait and do four or five rounds before I actually darn in. Uh, here's a little mini tip while we are talking about darning in tails. Sometimes you'll have pieces like this right next to each other. And what I like to do is I like to tie them together before I darn them in just for added security. But here is where it gets interesting. Instead of doing it just straight like this, go ahead and crisscross it slightly. And then that way they blend into each other. And then the blue goes back over to the blue and the black goes to the black and then you have a really nice join here and weave. And finally, tip number five is the slip stitch from behind to join new yarn. Now, typically what you would do when you're getting ready to join a new color, and I happen to be doing black this time, so I'm just going to go ahead and do that here now. You would pull through the front of your space there and join your new color. 
okay? And what we have here is we have a little bit of a pink showing through in our next block, and we don't want that. We want to have a nice clean join here. And that is where the slip stitch from behind comes in handy. So what you can do instead is do exactly the same thing, but instead of joining from the front, just start from behind. So we're doing the same thing, but we're going to come in from behind and pull our yarn through to join it. And as you can see already, it's pulling that pink to the back. And now you're probably wondering, well, then you're dealing with the same issue in the back. Well, no, you're not. For some reason, you can camouflage it better. When you tighten it, it just seems to go into uh, the pink, the back of the pink back there. And I'll show you here just in a moment. It's so cool. Okay. Go ahead and slip stitch in there because we know we're going to do that. Okay. Let's tighten everything. Now from behind, you can see that little spike has gone right behind the pink in there. You don't even see it. And of course, it's eliminated from the front as well. So I think that's about it. I hope you did get something out of this. I hope at least one of these ideas will be something that you can take away with you and use. Uh, also, if you're interested in learning more about the C2C technique in general, I do have a video with four different methods that you can try. I will add a link to that uh, at the end here. But otherwise, uh, thanks again for playing hooky with me and I hope to see you again very soon. Take care, bye.